Good morning and welcome to the Investment Migration Report. This morning, we're joined by Jason Wright, partner at the law firm Curtis Millay. Thank you for being here, Jason. Thanks for having me, Abdi. So, Jason, I know you've had a, a very long career, uh, both in the military and as a lawyer. Um, maybe just take a quick minute and tell us how you got involved in EB-5 and investment migration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, again, thank you for, for having me here. Um, I, I have to take issue with with the long career. Um, I still feel like my career is 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 getting going, but but I have been a lawyer for about twenty years. Um, I originally started in the, the EB five world back in nineteen ninety nine um, when I was a law clerk uh, in law school at George Mason University. I worked uh, for an EB five professional immigration law firm uh, back then when the EB five program was relatively new. And I had the opportunity to work at this firm for about a year uh, as a full-time law clerk. And then later, for my first years in law school, uh, I worked at the law firm while going to, uh, to school at the same time. So I, I've had a long arc in the EB-5 world uh, since then. And I have uh, uh, did serve, as you mentioned, on active duty in the U.S. military from about 2005 to 2014. And when I left as a full-time military attorney, I, I returned to a private practice, which also included some EB-5 matters. So let me let me preface that. When I said long career, I mean, I've been involved in EB-5 for about 10 years. And in any other industry, that's a short term. But in EB-5, that's a lifetime. So, that, so I'll, I'll correct myself. <laughs> so, so Jason, tell us a little bit about Curtis Millay. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I, I'm a partner in the litigation uh, department at, at Curtis Millay, uh, Prevo Colton Mosel. Uh, we're a firm that has been around for almost 200 years. We originally started on Wall Street back in 1830, and uh, we've we've uh, had an international presence uh, really uh, almost since day one. Uh, we're proud to say that we're one of the first law firms ever to have an international office, and now we have three offices in the United States, New York, Washington, D.C., and Houston, and then we also have 16 offices and financial centers around the world, to include uh, Dubai, where, where Priya is right now, uh, we just opened up, uh, in fact, an affiliate office in Saudi Arabia last week and uh, in other point, uh, parts of Asia as well and, and also in Europe and uh, uh, in, uh, South America as well. Perfect. And do you still serve in the U.S. Army? Uh, I do, Priya. Uh, so I mentioned I served uh, about 10 years on active duty and I'm currently a major in the U.S. Army Reserves where I have duty during the summer. I I spend uh, the month of July at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where I have a great time teaching the cadets constitutional law, military law, and also international law. Nice. And other than West Point, do you teach anywhere else as well? I do. I do. Um, I teach at uh, uh, Georgetown University Law School uh, as, uh, as a professor, uh, as an adjunct professor of law on issues concerning war crimes, uh, international criminal procedure, and also terrorism. And uh, that, that's a fall course. It's a lot of fun uh, making my way down to D.C. for that course. Sounds interesting. Now, Jason, I know, um, you know, during your duties in the U.S. Army, you've had some very high profile cases and some high profile clients. Are you allowed to talk about those? If you are, could you sure. tell, yeah, tell yeah. us some of those? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I mentioned I, I uh, worked in the EB-5 industry while in law school and before law school. And then I decided after 9-11 that uh, uh, the events of 9-11 uh, that I wanted to serve in, in the U.S. Army for a couple of years. And so I uh, accepted a direct mission as a military lawyer. We call that uh, a JAG or a judge advocate. And I served with the U.S. Army uh, from 2005 to 2014. I had tours uh, during that 10-year period uh, in Germany, uh, in Iraq, and also in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And uh, JAG attorneys are, are sort of like in-house counsel to a corporation. You, you can provide a variety of different services as a JAG attorney. You also can uh, be a, a litigator as a, as a criminal defense attorney representing soldiers before a court-martial or a prosecutor. And I had the pleasure of, of having a variety of different jobs. I, I spent um, about 15 months in Iraq from 2007 to 2009, serving as an international law advisor to a multinational division headquarters force. Uh, about halfway through that tour, actually, I became the aide-de-camp to the commanding general for this area, which is everything north of Baghdad. And then later, I ended up uh, representing soldiers before courts martial, which are simply just uh, criminal trials where soldiers are accused of misconduct. Uh, that experience, my experience in Iraq, and also some educational studies in, in human rights law, 
uh, led me to be a candidate to represent Guantanamo Bay detainees in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And beginning in 2011, I was officially assigned to the Office of the Chief Defense Counsel for the Department of Defense, which is a component under the Secretary of Defense's office, where I was assigned to two cases uh, to be part of a trial team to represent Guantanamo Bay detainees before the U.S. military commissions that are currently ongoing in Guantanamo Bay. And that was actually my last tour in active duty. I, I, I had that tour for three years from 2011 to 2014. And I had some very interesting uh, clients and matters uh, uh, during that time period. Interesting. And so since then, you've gotten back into handling EB-5 matters. I have. I have. So I left the military in 2014, and um, I uh, decided to, to establish a private practice. Um, I Essentially, as I say, in the, in the legal field, I, I put out a shingle. Um, so a shingle just is an old school way of saying I, I had my own shop ultimately as a solo practitioner. Uh, I left the U.S. Army, uh, was, was in between Guantanamo and D.C. at the time, and I moved to New York City. Uh, at that point in time, I needed to get uh, clients and, and build a, a business. And so I, I started to leverage my existing relationships I had made 15 years before in the EB-5 industry. And um, I brought together my litigation experience and I started to get involved in the EB-5 industry again from a different uh, angle. Whereas before I, I worked with about 90 EB-5 investors with various projects and I was filing the petitions. Now I got involved to be the fixer or the problem solver. So when something goes wrong with the petition and USCIS denies the petition, the individual has a right to go to federal court to overturn that denial, essentially. And so I got involved uh, at that stage to be the litigator who files a lawsuit on behalf of the investor to bring it into court to have a U.S. district judge essentially take a look at what the agency did with a view to potentially overturning that decision. So I became a problem solver where my job was to help investors, new commercial enterprises, and job creating entities to, to, to get a win where there may have been a denial before. I find this really fascinating because, you know, a lot of the clients, um, when when they're being sold a project or when they're being sold the EB-5 program, everyone focuses on the positives. But of course, investors have a lot of questions about troubleshooting and what happens if something actually goes wrong within the process or with a project, for example, or any of the number of things that could go wrong during the EB-5 process. So this is sort of where you step in and you help um, fix those problems, essentially. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the other matters that you've handled um, with things essentially going not right during the EB-5 process? Sure, sure. And, and you know, the lens um, uh, that I, at least initially I started handling these matters back in 2015, was in fact where um, after an individual files a petition, so a form I-526, uh, a petition to become an immigrant investor in the United States, um, I'm sure your audience is, well knows that, that there's an adjudication period uh, where the, the Immigrant Investor Program Office will review the petition. They may have questions about uh, the underlying uh, petition and the exhibits and support. Uh, the IPO, Immigrant Investor Program offer, uh, Office, may issue a request for evidence. And then at some point later down the road, whether it's two years, three years, you name it, there's a decision that could unfortunately deny the petition. So what my job is at that point as a litigator uh, is, to, is to consider what the record is. What is the, the, the actual filing itself? What did the investor submit? What exhibits did the investor submit? What was the response to a request for evidence or a notice of intent to deny, if any? And to think about whether or not the Immigrant Investor Program Office truly looked at this case from the right perspective. And if, and if they did not, then I'm able to file a lawsuit under the Administrative Procedures Act, which is a federal law under Title V of the United States Code that allows any individual who has been wronged by an agency action to seek judicial review in a U.S. district court or a U.S. federal court to have that decision reviewed to determine whether or not that agency denial was arbitrary or capricious or otherwise in violation of a law or a statute. So as a litigator, I, I look at this entire record and the, the I-526 filing, the responses to the RFE or to the notice of intent to deny, it may be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pages, depending on the complexity of the project. And, and to think about how the agency got it wrong and then to write a very compelling complaint, a lawsuit 
uh, is started with a complaint, a, a, a filing ultimately, where an individual sets forth their basis for why the agency made the wrong call, but to put forth a very compelling complaint as to why the agency was incorrect. And then to think about other ways through the litigation that I can supplement the record, so to speak, in order to build that case for the investor, uh, to convince the court, and frankly, to convince my opposing counsel. And I should add, the opposing counsel here is no longer uh, the uh, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. It's actually an assistant U.S. attorney who's assigned to that local federal court. So my job is also uh, to have a target audience here of the opposing counsel to try to convince them as well that their client, USCIS, made a wrong decision as well. So it's, it's, it's this uh, aspect of problem solving and using the law uh, and using the facts uh, and using the best of the law and the best of the facts to marshal the best case possible to convince your opposing counsel and also the court that the agency made a wrong call. And how often do you see um, success in these types of cases appealing denials? Well, I, I'm proud to say that um, I have I've had success in each one of my cases that has been able to go the distance, ultimately. Um, I, my first case was in 2015, and this was representing a, and uh, actually a, representing a regional center and a new commercial uh, enterprise. And back then in 2015, the way the law was, was that only an individual investor had the right to sue in a U.S. federal court for the denial of their petition. Well, my, myself and a co-counsel, we were successful in convincing the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia that regional centers and new commercial enterprises also have what's called standing to sue in federal court for the denial of an agency uh, decision on an individual investor's petition. So that, that legal question that was presented was a success uh, for various reasons. That, that project, actually, those investors decided not to continue with that project. But since 2015, I've had about a dozen cases under the Administrative Procedure Act. And I'm proud to say every single one of those has either been resolved uh, successfully for my client after filing a complaint and working with the opposing counsel uh, and, and getting them to see, in fact, that we're correct, that there should have been a, an approval of the 526, or it's gone to what's called summary judgment. And I can go into more detail uh, as to the steps in the litigation, or it's gone to summary judgment, and we've been successful in convincing the agency to approve the petition as well. So I, I'm, I'm batting a thousand when it comes to these cases that actually go the distance. Uh, so I'm very, very proud to be able to help out so many uh, investors and their families. And I think uh, I looked right before um, uh, we, we were speaking today, and I think I've assisted about 45 investors um, and their families come to the United States after getting a denial. And, um, and so that, that's a pretty good feeling. So, Jason, I know in this latest uh, attempt of uh, getting an EB-5 bill passed, one of the parts of the bill that wasn't very popular, including by us, we weren't very happy with that, but it was the poison pill we were willing to swallow to get a five-year reauthorization, was the part that uh, basically didn't allow you to sue the U.S. government and you would have to go through an appeals process. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And, and if you could maybe just uh, point out exactly how a mandamus lawsuit works. Sure, sure. And, and, and thanks for raising the mandamus piece. So in addition to, to serving as a litigator, uh, challenging agency denials, as you know, Abtine, uh, oftentimes these I-526 adjudications and even the I-829 adjudications can take three years. And the Administrative Procedure Act also provides an avenue for individuals to challenge an agency action that has been unreasonably delayed or unreasonably denied. So this is, is, is called the mandamus function, so a writ of mandamus, which basically means an action to compel the U.S. government to take an action. And individuals in the United States who are awaiting federal government agency actions for any type of, of federal program that they may be entitled to have the right to file suit in a U.S. district court to compel the agency to take action on that, that petition or that request if it's been unreasonably delayed. And that's an avenue as well where, where lots of immigrant investors may want to see some type of relief in the future subject to um, the, the Reform Act, because this is also something that can at least get the case moving again. Now, uh, to your question, um, if the right of judicial review is taken away uh, from investors and they're only able to go to the appellate process, ultimately within the administrative uh, agency process, I think that's a real problem. Um, one of the, the cornerstones of, of U.S. jurisprudence Ever since, uh, really, the nation's founding, there was a, a case 
about 50 years after our nation's founding called Marbury versus Madison, which set forth the right of judicial review. And that under our constitutional system in the United States, where we have three branches of government, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and of course, the judicial branch, there should be a, a checks and balances for each one of these branches so that one branch does not always have absolute control over a given area. I think it would be very dangerous, in fact, for there not to be the right of judicial review for these petitions, because the EB-5 program is, is a vital program for the US, U.S. economy. Uh, it's great for America's image and standing in the world. And I think it should not be subject to the political whims. It, there should be a process where judges should have the right and individuals should have the right to be able to review these cases to make sure that the executive branch is, is looking at these properly. You know, um, EB-5 investors, you know, and a lot of our audience that are looking at EB-5 or other investment migration programs, they look at the USCIS as a black hole. I mean, it's 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 really, you know, basically you, you submit a filing and you don't hear anything for two years. And if right. you want to in inquire about your case, you know, there, there is nothing. And uh, right now, a lot of regional centers, a lot of our uh, peers in the, in the market, they really look at this lawsuit process as a way of compelling the government to do th something or even to try to find out what's going on. You know, one, one, one thing I always hear is that there are, you know, 180 some plus agencies and there are only two agencies where you get no due process and it's DHS and SEC. And, and unfortunately, you work with both of them on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, can you maybe just talk about some some of those success stories where you're, you know, I, I know we, we talked about the Administrative Process Act, but on the mandamus side, could you talk about some success stories? Oh, absolutely. I, I can tell you, uh, typically, uh, let, let me let me go over the litigation process just, just for your audience. Um, and one of the things, and this, this picks up on a point that, that Priya raised as well, one of the, the one of the great things about, about investment migration in the United States is, in fact, our robust system of laws. And that investors, as Priya said, have so many questions about projects and you know, there's commercial due diligence, of course, and, and I, I advise individuals on commercial due diligence and on projects. I have a number of high, high net worth individuals that and I'll do due, due diligence for and, and choose a right project for them it, because it helps knowing where the problems are to advise your client at the start. But one of the benefits of, of the U.S. legal system is that we are, for the most part, unassailable. There are checks and balances, as I mentioned. There is the right to go to court if there's an issue. So while there may be delays in the process, Investors in the United States have so many rights already. And, and you know, I've seen you mentioned the SEC, right? Even the offerings need to have certain types of representations. And you know, the devil's in the details, of course, and, and making sure that commercial due diligence is right. But the U.S. legal system is there for a reason, and it provides a great deal of assurances, in my opinion, to my clients, that if something goes wrong, there's a chance they can get their money back, right? They can, use the, the, they can, they can file a lawsuit if they get their money back, potentially. Um, so there are a lot of benefits. Now, in terms of the, the mandamus relief, if an action has been unreasonably delayed, as I mentioned, an, an individual through an attorney can file a complaint, a mandamus complaint, a very short uh, filing that just says, I filed on this date. It's been more than two or three years or four years. Um, this, this action has been unreasonably delayed, uh, and I'd like to have a federal court uh, take relief. Typically, these, these petitions are no, no, no more than four or five or six pages in length. That, that starts the litigation process. There's a, a filing fee. I think currently it's about $400. And you have to serve a copy of this complaint by U.S. certified mail on the U.S. attorney for that particular federal court, on the U.S. attorney general, and on the agencies as well. So in this case, typically I, I name as defendants, I name USCIS, I name DHS. And the service of process fees for the certified mail usually is about $7 each. And you file it. Um, the government has uh, 60 days to answer the lawsuit. And I can tell you in my, my practice, usually you get a response, some type of meaningful response from your opposing counsel, who's now the assistant U.S. attorney, usually around day 50, they, they come online and they say, hey, I'm introducing myself, um, Jason, I'll be handling this case for the government, my clients, the, the agency, USCIS, let me take a look into this file and see what's happening. And I can tell you, I've seen usually um, there's, a, there's a, an action, an agency action on that petition within about four to six months of filing, which may not seem fast, Sometimes it's quicker, but if you've been waiting for four or five years and you file a lawsuit very quickly, you know, four, four months isn't bad to get an, uh, an action. Now, um, oftentimes the agency action is not what the investor wanted. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not that I-526 approval, but it's a request for evidence or a notice of intent to deny. 
But at least then you know what the issue is uh, and you can address that issue and you can move forward. And oftentimes, in fact, for some of the cases where I've handled mandamus, we've gone straight from getting the answer uh, to filing, uh, to getting the RFE, and then to winning at the RFE stage and getting the approval. And if we don't win, then we, we file suit under the APA in federal court under the Administrative Procedure Act, and I've been successful in that regard. So there are some clients where I've, I've handled a mandamus, um, and then they get a decision they didn't like, and then we file a lawsuit, and then we still get a, an approval at the end of the day. Uh, so follow-up question for, for our audience. I know... Um, a lot of our audience may not be familiar with uh, suing in administrative courts. And can you just explain the fact that no matter where the lawsuit is or the project is, that all of these cases are, are basically in, in D.C. courts? That's, right. That's my preference. Um, there is a doctrine under U.S. law of, of venue, ultimately, and where an individual uh, venue means uh, place or location, where a case can be brought. My preference is to bring these cases to the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C., because that particular federal courthouse, those judges, they deal with so many administrative agencies because they're all seated in, in Washington, D.C. That's where the headquarters of these agencies are. These judges are, are fantastic judges. They're sophisticated when it comes to the Administrative Procedure Act and the practice of uh, area called administrative law. And, and, I, and I find that um, they're able to call balls and strikes pretty easily when it comes to these issues. And the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia has also been very favorable by and large and their decisions on behalf of, of petitioners, especially where CIS may take an interpretation of one of their regulations that just doesn't make sense. Just, uh, it just defies logic. And so the, the, those judges are willing to, to, like I said, overturn uh, USCIS decisions and even their own interpretations of regulations where they just don't make sense. And have you seen an increase in mandamus filings, considering that processing times have gotten so much longer over the last couple of years? And if so, what is your suggestion for clients who've been waiting? How long do you generally suggest a client waits before they file a mandamus? That's a great, great question, Priya. And I, that's one I've had to research before. Uh, fortunately, we, we don't have to make it up out of thin air. So what, what the Administrative Procedure Act provides is that the delay has to be unreasonable, right? So the question is unreasonable to what? So oftentimes what I'll do for my practice is I'll take a look at the uh, USCIS annual reports. They're on, ombudsman's reports where they, where they produce, uh, they have a report every year that goes to Congress and they set forth uh, all the various program requirements of the EB-5 program. They'll talk about the number of cases that were filed that year, the number of pending cases, and they'll also have a reference to the average processing time. And so if the average, average processing time is 2.6 months or 2.7 months, and that's the average, then if I have a client who has a case that's been pending for four and a half years or five years at the I-526 stage, that's not really that reasonable, right? And, and so I'll use that as, as a neutral reference point ultimately for the court to define what is reasonable. Now, there have been cases, by the way, that I haven't filed these, but I've seen cases in, in reported cases where individuals have filed uh, within two years or within a year, and, and they're not going to fly ultimately because the U.S. government understands that these agencies have a lot of petitions. There is still a, a rule of reason that applies ultimately. So it, it, each case is different ultimately, um, and, and I know, unfortunately, for a lot of investors from Republic of China, there's been some case law as well that, well, that's a different issue. And uh, there's already already backlogs as well, given the quotas. Uh, they, they may not be as successful uh, as some other uh, investors as well, just given the backlog issues. And there's a case out of the Central District of California that actually goes to that point. I disagree with that, uh, that decision that that federal judge had, respectfully. But I, I think if you take a look at the annual report, you can get a good metric as to what reasonable is. And if that has been unreasonably delayed beyond that point, I think I think individuals are well within their rights to, to file for a mandamus action. And, and you know, interestingly, Jason, um, we used to get a lot of data from the USCIS. You know, the average processing time was anywhere from 21 months to 24 months. And now they've just kept it at like 48 months, which is not actual, the actual processing time. And, we, you know, obviously the reason they've done that, we suspect, is to not allow lawsuits because if they're not providing the average lawsuit time, uh, you know, and just leaving it at 48 months, which is not accurate, I, I think that makes it less compelling case that, you know, these cases are, are, are being adjudicated outside of the normal processing times. That, that's right. That's right, Abtina. And that's, that's um, 
that practice is unfair. I mean, one of the things the U.S. government is supposed to be is accountable and transparent. Uh, and, and so I would encourage stakeholders in the industry to, to file a Freedom of Information Act request. There's a separate law in the United States called the Freedom of Information Act, which allows for individuals uh, to petition the U.S. government for records, um, that uh, for records of U.S. government actions. And uh, this would be a great area uh, once a year, at the end of the year, for, for a stakeholder to write to CIS and DHS and say, please send us the average processing times or any, please send us any known records you may have concerning the average processing times for, for uh, I-526 petitions and I-829 petitions. And you know, if a stakeholder gets that, they can publish it online. Uh, it's been fully disclosed. And then you've got your neutral, neutral reference point for what that average processing time is. So Jason, for, for our audience, uh, you know, the, the, Immigration law is a very complicated part of the, the, uh, the legal system, and EB-5 is even more complicated. And then, you know, investors have to, you know, uh, understand securities laws, which is even more complicated. And that's why we, you know, we, we suggest investors get, you know, proper counsel in, in different areas of the law that are experts in that part of the law. But now, an even more complicated part of the law is the bankruptcy code. And I know you've worked on the bankruptcy court, and you've helped some EB-5 investors navigate that. I'd love to hear your point of view on, on some of those cases and how you've helped some investors in a bankruptcy code navigate EB-5 and ultimately get their green cards. Sure, sure. And, you know, there are so many benefits to the EB-5 program, but there, there are also a lot of risk, as everyone knows, that, that goes into it. You know, first and foremost, there's, there's commercial risk. The project may not be successful at the end of the day. And with, with the recent events of, of the global pandemic, there are a lot of EB-5 projects out there that may not have gotten the funding necessary to go forward, ultimately. The other funding, in addition to the investor uh, funds that came in. So the, the global pandemic has certainly hit the U.S. economy hard, especially the service industry, where there are lots of, of formerly viable EB-5 projects for hotels and restaurants and the like, and even in, in the construction industry. Um, so it's, it's, there have been some issues, um, certainly, across the U.S. economy which, of course, trickles down and affects EB-5 projects. So I was um, retained about a year and a half ago um, to advise, actually a year ago, to advise uh, two EB-5 uh, projects, um, not the investors themselves, but the actual job-creating entities. And these were plants, and just to, to protect um, uh, confidentiality and the like, I, I won't discuss names, uh, but I'll just I'll refer to these, these two plants as plants. So two different projects where um, they both had just entered into bankruptcy proceedings uh, in a U.S. bankruptcy court. And a team of individuals called restructuring officers or restructuring team came on board to, to manage the, the, these estates and determine whether these estates should be liquidated, so sold off all the assets, or whether it should go forward in the insolvency process and be sold as a, as a going concern, as going businesses. Now, between these two projects, there were a total of 250 investors all in various stages between I-526 and I-829. So it was, it was, if these um, projects folded, and if the assets were fully liquidated, fully sold off, then obviously there's no job creation generally, and there's no further investment for the purposes of satisfying the I-526 petition when the individuals go for consular processing, or even for the I-829 stage, if they're already in that stage. So it was a very um, difficult situation for these investors to be in. They, they stood to lose not only the full amount of their investment, but also their entitlement to um, immigrant visas uh, as EB-5 petitioners. So I, uh, I was brought on to advise the uh, restructuring team uh, how we can structure this if it goes into insolvency proceedings so that the EB-5 investors still retain a shot uh, at their green cards. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to report we've, we've given them that, that chance. This was a distress, these are distressed projects um, that were successfully sold um, to new investors, new new companies to take them over and to run these businesses as going businesses so that these investors still have now uh, the continued job creation. Um, any proceeds uh, that they that there will come out of these, these uh, estates will be redeployed back into uh, the business. And, you know, it, it, it's just one minor sort of blip in the administrative record, but one that's fully explainable, one that gives them a shot to meet all three of the statutory elements of the EB-5 program. You know, an investment in a new commercial enterprise that creates jobs, um, that involves, you know, uh, essentially improving the U.S. economy. So uh, we're, this is a success story in, in the making. And um, there's a lot of opportunity out there where uh, an individual may 
have invested in a distressed project to turn that into a success story. Uh, one of the things that I find really interesting is, so you were talking about with bankruptcy, often there there is restructuring that happens or that can happen. But unfortunately, there are also times when the project is not successful due to things like fraud um, or breach of fiduciary duty and where the investors stand to lose either their immigration benefit or their funds due to these things. So you've worked on commercial litigation cases like that as well. Could you maybe go into some of the cases that you've worked on in that um, arena? Absolutely. And, and this is a heartbreaking scenario uh, where so many investors uh, will, will take it on faith that their money is being managed well and that their interests are being managed well. You know, I go back to the benefits of, of investing in the United States and that not just under our federal system of laws. And, and Abtin mentioned uh, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, that has certain rules and requirements for offerings, but also under state law as well. And so many of these projects um, that I've seen uh, as a fixer, as a problem solver, they will, they will proceed for years where there are no updates to the investors. You know, once I take a look at the project file. There's no, uh, no minutes and, and resolutions of, of board meetings, uh, no audit of financials that are sent to the investors at the end of the year. All these sort of standard things that, we, that, that any investor in the United States would expect to see, um, oftentimes um, the investors are just not updated as to what's happening. And that's a red flag, ultimately. Um, and, and so when you have a situation where, where there's, there's not a free flow of information, or where uh, the investor is, is consistently requesting information from the general manager of the, of the new commercial enterprise or the regional center, and that information is not, not coming to the investor, that's a serious red flag. And I would encourage investors, if they have that situation, to, to, to potentially hire an attorney uh, to assist with that. Because if there's a red flag there, there may be red flags down the road. And, and I'm not suggesting that, that a lack of information means that there's fraud uh, or a breach of fiduciary duty, but a problem. But if there is a problem and if the investor's money is lost completely, then there, then there could be options to pursue recovery of that money against um, the, the general manager, against the new commercial enterprise, and any others who may have acted wrongfully. Um, I've had a couple of cases where I've advised investors on breach of contract, um, where they thought their money was going to this project, project A, but instead um, it was diverted to a different project without their knowledge. And the money was gone, it was com completely spent. So uh, what are the options available to the investor to, to sue for the recovery of, of, that, uh, of those funds? There are options um, to do that ultimately. Uh, I've advised investors on what we call books and records actions. So in the United States, uh, various state laws, if, you're, if you've invested in a project that's incorporated in Delaware, for example, an investor has the right to file a summary proceeding a very quick proceeding that's done in 90 days to, to get all the books and records of the investment and of the project. Same in New York. Uh, New York has a books and records action as well, a state law uh, action. And New York even has an additional cause of action that's available. It's, a, it's an action for an accounting where you can ask a court to appoint a forensic accountant to oversee and, and take a look at the books and records and tell you what the profits and losses may be. So that's something that I think a lot of investors uh, may not necessarily know is, is how many rights that they have from the U.S. legal system. And you know, I, I had uh, a call a couple weeks ago uh, for about a project, and uh, this this same red flag I mentioned. Uh, investors had, had been in the project for four or five years. Uh, you know, I've seen there was no uh, mandamus action filed to move it along, and they said we haven't heard anything about this project. Um, you know, in a, in a couple of years, and I said, well, this is what you can do ultimately. I think I want to highlight too is that my experience. You know, I my job is to handle the problem cases. Uh, there are so many successful investments um, out there, um, but you know, if, if, if an investor is not getting the information they need, there's options. And if the investor has concerns about, the, about how their investment is being managed, there are options as well. But I do think that by, by and large, these are the, one, the cases I handle are, are not the, the norm, they're the exception ultimately. Jason, do you handle um, investor groups? Have you had investor groups that are not happy about where the direction of the project is going and they're not trusting the NCE or the NCE operators and going to you directly? Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. And, and a variation of, of the theme I mentioned in terms of investors not feeling confident that they're getting the information that they've requested. 
and that's there. That really is, is potentially the next step. Um, and so if, if investors do feel that the investment's not meet, being managed properly, pursuant to state law, where that new commercial enterprise uh, may be incorporated, there may be options available under, if it's a limited liability company or a limited partnership, uh, there may be options under the terms of, of that governing agreement, the LLC or LLP agreement, for investors to actually take over the business. Um, or to compel a court uh, in, in that particular state, state court, to appoint the, the a new management team uh, at the request of the investors. So this is an area that merges together, corporate law and also litigation as well. But that, that's a great point and that you know, investors are not powerless, ultimately. If they, they feel that their investment is not going in the right direction, uh, if, if, if the governing agreement says you need a super majority, two thirds percent uh, to change the general manager, well, maybe you can do that. Uh, if you're 100 investors in a project, all you need is 66 to boot out the general manager and bring in a new team, uh, a team like I worked with on the restructuring side, right, to come in and, and manage it properly. So that's also an option that's available. That's good to know because I know like for my clients, for example, or for potential clients, one of the scariest things to them is the fact that they're immigrating to a brand new country and then not being familiar with the legal system, not being familiar with what um, rights they do have as investors in case something happens. So this is all very good information for our listeners. Absolutely. So, so Jason, I know there are, you know, for lack of a better word, I don't want to men mention any names. There are funds out there that are considered vulture funds that they see the weaknesses in, in documentation, the weaknesses in management, and are going in and, and taking over uh, defaulted EV-5 projects and, you know, trying to make a return. And, you know, and then there are groups out there. And, and, and in those cases, they're basically, you know, they don't really care about the EV-5 investors. To them, everything's dollars and cents. And they'll, you know, def default a project to make a few bucks. And the EV-5 investors are left in, in a pretty bad position. Yeah. And there are other groups out there that are basically doing the same thing, but with the you know being cognizant of saving the EB five investors, still looking for for a profit in defaulted EB five projects. Can you can you talk? I mean, I know you can't talk uh, specifics, but can you talk about groups out there that are cognizant and are helping the EB five investors and and in the process making a profit for the funds? Yeah, and I think I think you touched on it, uh, Abtine, is that that the goal is for. Uh, for these, uh, you use the, the term vulture fund, right? I'll use that as well. For, for any vulture fund that's coming into a distressed asset, a distressed EB-5 project, um, the, the goal for them is to see the, the commercial benefit, actually, in, in helping the EB-5 investors and bringing them along as allies in this process. There is any vulture fund that comes in and says, we have a distressed EB-5 project. We're just going to buy it. We're going to liquidate it. We're going to get rid of it. They're, they're really being short-sighted about the ongoing commercial benefits, ultimately, of, of a particular project. And, the, uh, and essentially, they're, they're also neglecting that these investors may have additional access, access to capital and resources themselves. Um, and secondly, they're also, these vulture funds are also neglecting the possibility, I would think, that these investors may hire an attorney like me, uh, to, to go in and to challenge the vulture fund and to file lawsuits to block their efforts, which could then essentially cause litigation risk where, where there could be no action taken for any number of years while, while the investors' rights are being protected and pursued. So I think it's very short-sighted uh, at the end of the day. I think if, if there are groups out there uh, that, that are thinking about targeting and acquiring distressed EB-5 projects, the right way to think about this from a commercial perspective is how can we do this in such a way not only to benefit the U.S. economy, not only to make money for, for the fund, that, that's an obligation that the fund has, of course, but to do it in such a way that, that it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, and that, that really should be the focus, I think, at the end of the day. And that's, that's been certainly my experience, is, is to try to pursue those win-wins when I'm advising a restructuring team, for example. Um, and that, that's, I think, how you get success. And so you've worked so much with um, overcoming denials and issues with projects. I'm sure you have some great information or recommendations for investors who are currently thinking about going into EB-5, um, participating in EB-5. Um, I know that you also advise on projects as well for due diligence on projects for investors. So do you have any kind of suggestions or recommendations, um, tips or tricks that investors can pay attention to when they are looking into the EB-5 process? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, absolutely. I, my, my, my first recommendation would just be um, just stay engaged. Um, if, if, investor is a, if an investor is a limited partner investor in a project, uh, ask, to, ask to have uh, your, a, a, at least a, a quarterly report or an annual report sent to you. Um, attend meetings, uh, any annual meetings that, that uh, may occur on the project. And if they're not happening, ask to have annual meetings. But really stay engaged. And this is your investment ultimately. Uh, and and uh, you want to make sure that your money is being managed appropriately. So really just stay, stay engaged in part of the process. And if you do have a concern that, that arises, you know, certainly avail yourself of the opportunities in the United States to potentially hire an attorney to assist you just in getting more information and to be your advocate in that regard. Because if, if you do, if your gut tells you there's an issue with it, then you should probably pursue it. And again, you know, I, I work on the problem cases that are the, the minority, not, not the norm. Most projects are successful. They go great. There, there's no issues. But you know, if you're out there and even you've invested five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, and you think you know I haven't heard anything in a long time, I'm a little concerned, and my emails to go unreturned. Well, then maybe you want to reach out to someone. And you know, and if funding's an issue uh, for you, and perhaps you know the five hundred thousand dollar investment was was your entire life savings. Well, there's probably other investors as well um, who are in the same boat within your project, and maybe you guys can all talk, and you can all go, and you all can get together and. And, and everyone uh, hire an attorney together to handle these issues. So if you feel that there's something going on in your gut, trust your gut, ultimately. I would say for the other stakeholders, so for the new commercial enterprises and the JCEs and the regional centers, uh, just maintain great books and records, ultimately. Um, make sure that um, what you're doing is is um, you know is in the best interest of the investors at all times, which which ultimately is to preserve their, their investment, certainly has to be at risk, but you know pursue their project um, Make sure they're updated, and you know, really do your best to make it a going concern. If you do have a red, if you do have something happen like a global pandemic, and you find yourself potentially with a distressed project, you know, certainly carry through on your fiduciary obligations to continue to get as much funding as possible, continue that to, to pursue that. But if you find yourself in a situation uh, as as a NCE or a regional center or a JCE, and you have a distressed project, well, I think it's probably that point in time that you you need to bring in some additional funding and capital and. Bring in a, an EB-5 professional to advise you on how to make this a win-win for the investors, too, because you don't want to have that litigation risk uh, out there where you're fighting uh, a war on multiple fronts and you're, you're also uh, doing a disservice to the investors as well. I think finally, for the attorneys out there who, um, who may be advising um, on, on deals and potentially filing lawsuits under the APA to challenge denials, uh, just take a hard look at the administrative record in each one of the cases. And if you if you believe that the administrative record uh, for, your, for the, the cases isn't strong enough, you, you've got to do everything um, early on to, um, to make sure that um, the record is supplemented appropriately. Because under the record rule for Administrative Procedure Act cases, the U.S. District Court, the judges, will only look at what the USCI is considered. So if there's something you want to bring to the U.S. District Court that was not in the administrative record below, you're out of luck. So think about strategies where um, if, if, you, if you get an RFE and you, you, you need to make sure you have the right of judicial review on this, supplement that, the administrative record as much as possible uh, to make sure that you get the best record on, on, on that challenge to the U.S. US District Court. Um, but you know, thanks, uh, great question. Um, and I, I, I do fear that um, uh, at least on, on – the issue of the global pandemic and distressed projects. You now, I, I think there's there's going to be some challenges there, but there are also are solution sets available uh, out there if people think about these things appropriately. So, Jason, I know um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I assume you're familiar with the Barian case that essentially mm -hmm. overturned uh, you know the administrative process uh, of um, of the rulemaking of of making you know the USCIS essentially changing the uh, the investment amount to from five hundred thousand to nine hundred thousand. Um, what is your opinion? Do you think that there was some form shopping going on uh, in the Northern, Northern District of California in that case? You know, Bering is a regional center that hasn't really been too involved, too active in EB-5, but they happen to be the, you know, the, uh, the regional center that, that filed that lawsuit. Um, what is your, what is your uh, point of view on that? Yeah, yeah. And for, and for form shopping is the, is the term of art that lawyers were used um, to try to pick the best venue possible for a, the best decision. Um, it, it may have been. I, I think the U.S. District Court of D.C. would have rendered the same decision. Um, and, you know, this issue was was predicated uh, in large measure on the appointments clause 
Um, and the U.S. District Court out of D.C. and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, they, they've been the, the, the leading uh, courts in the country on issues of appointment clause violations. And so I, I think it probably would have had the same result just about anywhere, uh, frankly. It's, it's, uh, uh, so it's possible uh, that there may have been, but I don't think it would have made a difference one way or the other. It was, it was the right decision to make. And, and from an APA pr- process, do, does the USCIS now have to go back to uh, comment and notice period if they want to enact the same rules? Or, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of complexities in APA, and yeah. I, I know just enough from, from my administrative law class to, to yeah. be dangerous, but I don't know anything about it. So I wanted to get your point of view on it. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, and so uh, for, for those in the, uh, in the audience that, that haven't attended an administrative law class uh, like you and I have team, you know, basically, it, when there's a statute, and there's the EB-5 statute out here that has very basic requirements, you know, about job creation, capital contribution, and a, into a new commercial enterprise or trouble business, right? Those are the statutory requirements. Well, then, whenever a statute's passed, um, the agency that's responsible for implementing this program uh, has the responsibility and the opportunity to pass regulations to implement the statute. And, and so this has been going on since the 90s, where... Uh, the statute was passed, and then every once in a while, uh, USCIS will, will revise and implement new regulations to, to give their interpretations as to what Congress meant and what the rule should be. So, for example, the at-risk requirement, right? That's not in the statute. That's in the regulations. Um, you know, here, to answer your question, Epstein, I, I think the safest bet for the U.S. government would be to go through a new notice and comment period. Because if they do not go through a new notice and comment period, even though they already had one before, I can see litigation opportunities. If, if someone gave me a call and said, hey, Jason, they just passed these new rules and uh, now we're back up to a million bucks um, for, uh, you know, for these projects, uh, is, there, is there an issue under the APA? Well, I, I probably would, would take a hard look at the APA and say, well, could be, could be. They can't ratify it after the fact and, and use the same notice and comment period. And I'm assuming there would be some changes too, uh, a couple changes in the regulations. And if there's any material changes at all in the, regula- the proposed regulations, they're going to have to go through a new notice and comment. So I think that's the safest bet for any administration is to go through that period again. And, and in that case, I mean, they only focused on just the legality of the head of DHS. There's a lot of other po- points that they could have pointed out in the suit, which they probably will if, if, if you know, if the agency were to, you know, re- renew the RACs. Right. So I, I think it's important for our audience to just understand how that process works. So, and then the other part is, I think the the comments and notices are going to be different today than they were, you know, six, seven, you know, five years ago, whenever they did the comment notice period. Yeah. Which, by the way, they didn't listen to a lot of the comments. They mm-hmm. they did the comment notice period, but they didn't listen to most of the comments that says, right. "Don't raise the price; you're going to lose a lot of investors." And they did it anyway. Right. Right. I think that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. You know, it remains to be seen how this will be handled, and of course, the Reform Act as well, and the reauthorization. But, but uh, my hope is that the stakeholders in the government really see the value in the program. And the goal here, Congress, when they, when, they, when they passed this back in the 90s, the goal was not to make this hard for the investors. The goal was, was to say, you know, we want to we, we, we bring over talented investors, entrepreneurial investors, investor, investors who have capital to the United States. And that's always been a very positive aspect of our U.S. immigration system, ultimately, is to open our doors to the world's best and the brightest, which include entrepreneurs and, and, and businessmen and women. So why why so many hurdles? Why so many barriers? Let's let's make it sensible, understandable, and and expedient at the same time, which it has not been. I mean, you're absolutely right, Jason. I mean, I think there are you know investment migration programs, and we talk about those. There's probably more than forty of them. There are ones where you you send in your check and you know your address, and they literally just mail you a passport. <laughs> And then there are the U.S. program where you got to go through all these hoops. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, a lot of these passports in the countries are, you know, their passports aren't worth much to the investors because the investors are looking for secondary education. That's the number one goal. They want they want somewhere with 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 uh, you know banking system with the rule of law where the property and their assets are going to be protected, which the United States offers, whereas a lot of these other countries may or may not offer. And then you know the opportunity to become a a, a citizen, which a lot of countries you don't offer. And a lot of countries, you know, the passport gives you a second, you know, you're a secondary citizen. You're not a primary citizen. With the U.S. passport, you can become a citizen and you can have every rights and responsibility that the citizen has, with the exception of maybe um, running for president of the United States if you weren't born here. But everything else you have, and, and I think a lot of these other countries don't offer that. 
But if we made the, the EB-5 program just a little bit less restrictive and, and work with these investors and make it more, you know, faster processing times and, and not having to, you know, wait 10 years to get a U.S. residency, I think this is the number one choice. I don't think there is any other program that could even come close to competing. That's right. Uh, for all the reasons we've, we've talked about, uh, investing into, into the United States comes with certain legal rights, right, uh, from, from the get-go. You know that your, your money is going to be much safer invested in the United States than in the, the gold passport program in Malta. No offense to Malta. Um, but I'd rather invest a million dollars in the United States than, buy, than, than attempt to buy a, a million-dollar property in Malta. I know that, um, that my, my money is going to be much safer here in the United States. And Aptine, you're absolutely right. A, a U.S. passport is, is a gateway to the world, ultimately. Uh, it's a gateway to further education for your children uh, and for your successive generations. And you know, America still is, in my view, uh, certainly has problems. Um, but America still is the, 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 the shining city on the hill. And this is a great place to raise a family, start a business, and, and build a life. So, Jason, if you had one, uh, you know, one suggestion you would have to Congress, both the Senate and the House, on renewing the EB-5 program that it's been expired, what would that be? Stop hurting families. Stop hurting American businesses. Uh, the, the pandemic was hard enough. And uh, the EB-5 industry provides a great source of capital to essentially help America move forward again. This is not a, a should not be something where, where people's lives and their futures, uh, not just the prospective investors, but the American businesses that rely on the capital, should, this should not be a time for, for playing politics, ultimately. And get it done. So Jason, you've, you've helped at least 40, 50 investors with their immigration petitions, and you've saved another you know, 250 to 300 investors uh, by, by, by helping them getting out of the defaulted situation and getting them their I-526 approvals and hopefully later I-829 approvals. If investors are left in a situation where they're desperate and they have no help from the NCE or the regional center, where, where can they contact you? Where can, where can they get in touch with you to pretend, hopefully you can help those investors as well? Sure. Well, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be happy to, to, to help and to, to speak with the investors about their issues. And also uh, JCEs and NCEs and regional centers for distressed projects. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say, as mentioned, Curtis Malay, Provoke Colton Mosul has been around for a long time. We've seen a lot of, of issues arise in the industry. And we also represent funds as well, EB-5 funds. So we have a lot of knowledge and expertise here. Uh, so if anyone would like to, to get in touch with me, uh, my email address uh, is uh, jwright at curtis.com, C-U-R-T-I-S.com. You can go to our website as well and, and send us a message. And um, I'd be happy to, to speak to, to any stakeholder out there, whether they're investors or you know, a, a corporate concern as well. Um, it, it would be my pleasure to do that. Well, Jason, it's been wonderful having you on. We, we both, Priya and I, I think have learned a little bit more than we knew. And uh, I'm sure our audience is going to be you know, ecstatic to listen to, to your comments. So thank you so much. Hopefully we can have you again on the show soon. Uh, it, I'd be delighted to, to appear again. And uh, I think we're going to see some interesting times, I hope, over the next couple of months. Uh, hope springs eternal that Congress is going to do the right thing here shortly. So I'd, I'd uh, come back anytime. And thanks for your time today as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.